uh, cable networks and uh, fiber to the home that will be delivering uh, movies on demand, um, and Viacom and Time Warner uh, and AT&T and, uh, and the company that's now Verizon, uh, which will uh, deliver the broadband interactive future uh, to all of us. And so the internet really at the time and the web and the mosaic really were sort of renegade uh, academic research projects used by government contractors, used by universities. But, you know, obviously everybody, you know, everybody knew at the time there was no way to ever make money on the internet. Um, so, you know, we had extremely low expectations. And, and then, of course, after that, it just, it just took off. At, at what point did you know you were onto something that you saw, you know, some inflection that, that told you this was going to change? The game. Well, it, it, it ran for really fast. It went. We, we released it uh, to about a dozen beta users, and then they spread it. It's sort of almost classic viral. They spread it to 100 people. They spread it to 1,000 people. They spread it to 10,000 people. By the end of '93, we probably had a million users. By the end of '94, uh, right around when we released Netscape Navigator, there were you know multiple millions of users. Uh, it spread incredibly fast. But I would say it wasn't. It actually wasn't until after we founded Netscape, uh, I think, at least that I started to have a sense that there was going to be something lasting that this was going to be a real phenomenon. Because again, even as the internet took off, all the hype around the, what at the time was going to be the information superhighway, the interactive television future, all of that hype was still building um, all through that period of time. Right. Turned out, you know, all of that, it turned out all the interactive TV hype was basically just a big game by the cable companies to juice their stock prices so that they could sell their companies. Um, but they didn't let us in on that secret uh, while we were working on the internet thing. So well, it's, it's not like your stock price suffered. Well, it, it, turned, it, it turned out okay. Um, but, um, you know, it was, a, it was a very confusing time, and, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I really carry away from that is, you know, often they're, they're really revolutionary, really profound things. You know, they're not recognized up front, and not only are they not recognized up front, people have a lot of reasons to believe uh, that they're not going to succeed. And a lot of experts, uh, and a lot of the media, and a lot of business people, uh, and a lot of big companies are busy explaining to the world why, you know, this thing is just a toy, and it's off to the side, it's not going to mount anything. Right. Now, the companies that you mentioned, all of them, I would say, now, would say we are extremely important players in this space. Absolutely. Uh, all of them now are actually providing video on demand, movies on demand. Broadband is probably their most profitable piece of their business, next to maybe ringtones. Um, so what do you make of all of those guys now as opposed to then? And do you, are you concerned in any way about the way they're approaching the, the, this opportunity compared to the, the sort of general vibe of, of the web uh, up, until, up until now? Well, I think it, you know, it really depends which companies and which industries you're talking about. Um, I, you know, the good news is you know, I think most people see that the future for most forms of entertainment, communication, and interactivity uh, you know, is, is the internet. There are very few people arguing against the internet, uh, per se. Um, by and large, I think most of the major media companies are still largely unprepared for the shift, which is ironic given how long it's, you know, how, how, how long this stuff has, has been. You know, if you look at what's happening in newspapers right now, you know, it's just, a, they're, they're just an absolute freefall uh, from a business standpoint. Um, and it's actually a very ironic sort of time for the media industry because, for example, newspapers and magazines, it's not uncommon for them to have ten times the number of readers online but a tenth of the amount of online revenue is in the print revenue and really still no idea how to bridge that gap. So I think you know, there's a whole story for sort of the future of the media industry that has yet to be written. Uh, the telecom companies you know, are, are huge enablers uh, of, uh, of everything that's happening today, but you know, I'd say their level of unease about you know, a future in which they're carrying very large uh, amounts of what they would view as commodity bandwidth um, is, you know, is, is, is very acute. Um, and I think that is probably my fault. Barrier. Yes, that is probably my fault. <laughs> Move that to the other side of the couch. That'll be safer for my health that way too. Um, you know, they're 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 uneasy about being in sort of a commoditized future is is pretty acute right now. And so I think there's there's some temptation afoot to try to figure out how to lock down right. uh, or control or do differential pricing, different things. You know, that could have pretty serious adverse consequences down the road. Actually, for the industry as well as I actually I think for them. Right. But you know, that said, you know, it's it's it, for a lot of this stuff. You know, this you know we're 15 years into it and yet things are still developing. A lot of things are still unknown. I want to take you back maybe 14 or 13 years uh, to when you guys were growing, uh, as you pointed out, and you realized you had a business. You had a business model, yeah. um, uh, and, and it sort of has some enterprise piece to yeah. it, right? You yeah. were selling enterprise installations of your software, 
and, and, and that was doing pretty well. Well, when Netscape started, we had, we really, I mean, again, everybody, everybody told us there's no way to make money on the internet, so John Doerr and Kleiner Perkins was willing to take a leap on us. Uh, not his first, not his last. Not his, not his first, not his last, but he was willing to take, take, take a big bet on us, but, you know, other than that, uh, you know, other than him and a very small number of others, there was a huge amount of skepticism, and we weren't sure, right? This was 94, so there was no advertising online, there was no software sales to speak of, ISPs, we're a small but very fast-growing business, but we, we, that wasn't our business. So we actually launched three lines of business. We launched a, a browser business, which was free for academic and nonprofit use, but paid for commercial use. We launched a enterprise software business, and we actually launched a website business early on, an advertising business. Right. Um, and as it turned out, um, uh, all three of them worked, and even after the browser business ultimately went to zero, as we made the browser completely free, and it ultimately, of course, turned into Mozilla, um, you know, the other two continued to grow very fast. So. I'm going to bring something up that I know you hate to talk about, but in 1995, Microsoft decided, hey, Mark's got a pretty interesting thing going on, and I think it might be competitive, so we're going to uh, build exactly what he's got, try to make it a little better, and then give it away for free. And in fact, they used my code from the University of Illinois to do that, which was very exciting. <laughs> I can imagine. To this day, if you go into Internet Explorer, you go to the About box, you get the credit from Mosaic from the University of Illinois. So. I'm sure that that didn't bother you at all. It's, it's very fun, that one. Yeah. Um, and, and when you got the news that all of a sudden, you know, Big Papa was in town, uh, <laughs> Did you freak out? No. So, no, in, in all honesty, we did the, so what we did, basically, as I said, we didn't know what the future business was going to be of the company. Um, and so we launched the three businesses simultaneously. Um, as it turned out, the software business was growing incredibly fast. And by the time we sold the company in 98, the software business was $400 million a year uh, at that point. And then it turned out also the website business it turned out to be a big advertising business. So sort of all through that time period, which I think 90s, for sure 95, 96, and maybe even 97 and 98, for a while there, we were bigger in ad revenue than all of the internet portals and search engines combined. Um, and then even when we, uh, by the time we sold the company, it was like a $200 million a year business, which was still a very large internet advertising business at that point. So our view was, you know, we adapt. And we, we just, you know, we, we do it at times. We focus on the parts of the business that are working and, and, and growing very fast. Um, and then the, the browser, you know, turned into Mozilla, which has turned into Firefox, which has turned into a huge success. And yeah. you know, it's used by a very large number of people. And it's a very positive force. So, you know, I think all of us involved back then certainly feel very good about how that turned out. How, how do you look at, if you look at the landscape now, the legacy of the browser and where we are right now, what is it you like about what you're seeing and what is it you wish perhaps might have evolved differently? Oh, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's, I mean, I think it's turned out, you know, a lot, as I say, far better than, than anybody could have possibly thought. Um, I think that, you know, if, if there's one big surprise uh, in it all, I think it's, and this really shouldn't be a surprise from a sort of history and technology standpoint, but maybe the big surprise is how many of the early ideas that we had, which in many ways were experiments, um, have lasted and have become very significant. So, uh, you know, JavaScript, we needed a, we needed a, a scripting language. We, need, we knew we needed the browser to be programmable, so we, we created JavaScript. We just rewrote it, we put it in there. Uh, and we wrote it because we, we just, we at the time, we couldn't identify a, a better alternative and we wanted to write a language that would be similar to Java because everybody thought Java would be the dominant language uh, for applets in the browser. So we wrote JavaScript. And you know, it, it, you know, it, it, it came out, Russian enthusiasm, then sort of a long fallow period, and then in the last five years, it's become just an enormous, you know, an enormous phenomenon. It's probably the most widely used programming language in the world. Um, or cookies. You know, cookies were something that uh, Vint Cerf and I cooked up over a weekend because um, we needed a way to implement. Literally, we were implementing a, an e-commerce site for MCI where Vint was working at the time, and there was no way to do a shopping cart. And so Vint and I sat down on a napkin and said, you know, there needs to be some way, you know, to know when the user, same user is coming back. And he said, how about this cookie thing? Now, you know, and, and, and so these... Oh, it was just a, it was a long-standing sort of tradition in the software industry that if you were going to have just a, basically a little snippet of information that you would you, you would you would call it a cookie, and so we just we, we stole the name. Um, it had been used for 30 years you know, before, but within a couple of years, not only did had cookie become re, been redefined to mean a browser cookie, but it was also the you know everybody thought for a while that it was the big threat to you know user privacy. And to this day, you see these articles. I don't know that that particular debate's over. Well, these cautionary articles basically saying disable your cookies in the browser, otherwise your privacy is ruthlessly violated, and people will be able to read everything you do. Um, and again, you know, it's just it was it was sort of a a, a very rapid implementation. Uh, of something that has turned out to have enormous long-run consequences. And there were a whole series of those things. You know, the back and the forward button. You know, we, we couldn't think of a better way to navigate at the time. 
So we said, oh, how about a back and forth button? And then ultimately, people smarter than us will figure out a better way to navigate. And we're sitting here 15 years later. And not only is the back and forth button still in the browser, but now it's in iTunes, and it's in the OS, and it's in you know, Mac OS. It's all over the place. So. What do you make of some of the new uh, interfaces that sort of have evolved beyond the browser? I mean, I think that Apple's interface for the iPhone is oh. one such example. Uh, do you expect that the browser sort of disappears and melts into the computing experience over time? I mean, this has been a discussion, one that I think Microsoft has almost hunted on, uh, because for years Microsoft is saying that the future is the PC, it's the PC, it's the PC, it's not the cloud. And we're going to get into your 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 company, Loud Cloud, that became Oxware. Uh, it's the PC, and I think at this conference, Microsoft announced, you know, well, actually, the cloud's pretty important, but it's the mesh. It's the mesh. We'll call it the mesh. <laughs> exactly. uh, uh, but it's the cloud. Um, okay. <laughs> strikes me. Um, sort of. Uh, right? Um, so, what do you think about that? I think that at various times in the last 15 years, people have said that the browser is sort of a half step towards a new operating system, a web operating system, where the interface is much more fluent, fluid and much much less sort of constrained by this particular application. Well, again, that's, we, we, we assumed, or at least I always assumed that's what would happen. I assumed the browser was a halfway step, and it would just, the internet would just melt into the rest of these UIs, and, and, and it would be integrated. Like I say, the back and forward button were not intended to be a long-term thing. The bookmarks, the whole concept of bookmarks, I mean, God, there has to be a better way to do it than that. And yet, There's about 100,000 entrepreneurs who have started companies. <laughs> exactly, and yet here we are, and, 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 you know, lots of people use bookmarks. So, you know, the, the surprising thing to me has been the persistence of, 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 of all of it, and in particular the persistence of the browser as a metaphor and as a distinct piece of software. Um, even within OS has been has has, has been amazing, and I, I think a big part of it, um, you know, I just almost look at it through an economic lens, which is the advantage today of building a site that can be used through a browser is you have access to everybody in the world who who has a browser, and if you build your site any other way, you know, you're you're choking off your audience. Right. Um, and so there's really no incentive for anybody to create any sort of service that isn't accessed through a browser, and so therefore there's no incentive for a user to anything other than a browser. And in fact, what's been happening in the last five years is just really striking, which is more and more stuff is being put in the browser, right? So, yeah. but to give you an example. So, it, you know, it's been sort of this cliche of the industry that email is, you know, used by old people like you and me. Um, and then instant messaging is used by kids. Well, it turns out instant messaging was used by kids five years ago. Instant messaging is actually falling on a relative basis. And it turns out that kids, real kids today, are communicating primarily, of course, through social networking, through Facebook and MySpace, um, which are websites that run in a browser. So all of a sudden, you've got a whole generation of kids where they're literally communicating through the browser. And like that, we would have never anticipated that. We would have never predicted that. So if anything, everything's being jammed further and further into the browser. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's working to everybody's benefit, but it's ironic because this single metaphor, you know, yeah. in fact, continues to persist. And, it, you know, it, it, with the, the head of steam that's been built up now, you know, it could persist for another 15, 20 years before the next step is taken. So let me ask you to pull back and put on your uh, industry observer hat and talk about a few big companies, big names. Um, you have a, a blog which I'll, you know, happily, you know, uh, plug for you because I think it's a really good read. Um, and uh, you opine on any number of subjects there. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to opine, and I'm going to start with your favorite one, Microsoft. Um, <laughs> Wonderful company. Thanks. <laughs> Many, many argue, and actually on this stage at the, well, the Web Summit a year and a half, two years ago, we had a number of folks from, from Microsoft uh, on a, in a conversation in which they said, look, you know, we're not the bad guys anymore. Google is, you know. <laughs> um, and that was pretty much the response. <laughs> it was a dinner, and I think half the audience was a bit, you know, had a one or two glasses of wine more than perhaps they should, so because the back of the room started sort of, you know, jeering. Um, but I, I think there is a reasonable statement to, from, from Microsoft, at least a defensible one, that, you know, look, guys, we're trying to, you know, do good, we're, we're, we're paying attention, we're embracing open. Is Microsoft as a company, from your point of view, defanged? No, I, look, I think that they've got a very important role to play. I think that they're doing a lot of really good work. I think the mesh work that, that Ray's doing and that the team up there is doing is really good. Um, I think that they have a, you know, obviously still a big head of steam in the operating system business, a very large presence on, on desktops. They're very aggressive pushes into video games and mobile. But at the same time, there's certainly more counterweights in the industry today than there have been for a long time. 
right? So, you know, Google's certainly doing just great, and there's lots of other companies that I think are, are, are rising. And so I think, you know, the, 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 the landscape in many ways has splintered and fragmented in a very positive way. You know, there's new kinds of product offerings, there's new kinds of companies, there's new kinds of business models. Uh, so there's more diversity, there's more freedom, there's more creativity. I think that's the big thing. So speaking of splintering and fracturing, what do you make of Microsoft buying Yahoo? I, you know, I think if the deal goes through, I think it'll be, I think it'll actually be a really good deal. I think they'll, they'll, they'll get a lot out of it. I think the combined company will be successful. If, uh, but I'm one of the people who says if the companies stay separate, there's a lot that each of them can do individually. We are too teeny tiny bit saddened by the idea of Yahoo not being a standalone separate brand. Well, it's always a it's, a, it's always a little bit sad the prospect of an entrepreneurial company, you know, especially one that's had that that kind of success over the years, um, not being independent. But at the same time, you know, it is you know over over time these things are part of the natural evolution. And you know, one of the things that happens is you know opportunity gets created for new companies to come along. Um, and I, you know, the, the big thing I focus on, I'm sort of an entrepreneur at heart, so the big thing I focus on is are there, are there opportunities for lots of new companies? And I think right now there are a lot of opportunities for new companies. I think there are opportunities for new companies if these companies <coughs> stay separate. I think if they combine, there will be just as much or more opportunity for new companies. Um, and so, you know, in a sense, the, the sort of underbrush of the valley, you know, keeps, keeps developing. There's a huge amount of, amount of activity sort of below the canopies. Uh, that are established by these companies, whether they combine or not. Well, let's talk about that underbrush, because you said, uh, by the way, congratulations on your recent financing, um, uh, uncovered by a, a blogger, uh, and uh, you posted about it, um, and then you were interviewed by, by one of the sites, uh, in, and you said something to the effect of, it's nice to have this kind of money for the coming nuclear winter. <laughs> yes. I would, Do you I would care to elaborate. I would, I would agree with that statement that I made. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate on what you mean by coming nuclear winter and perhaps give us a few tips as to how to build our bunkers? Stock up on pork and beans. Um, so, first of all, I, the last thing I would ever claim to be is an economic forecaster, or at least an economic forecaster is any good at it. So, I, 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 don't, I have no idea really what's going to happen, but I. There's this unbelievably dramatic thing happening in the in the financial markets as a consequence of this credit, this massive credit bubble that built up over the last five years that's, that's all of a sudden bursting. Right. So there's this huge irony for our industry where basically after the stock market crash in 2000 and 2001, all the money that got taken out of the stock market got put into real estate, and then a lot of that, you know, in turn got put into credit, and then this sort of big credit bubble developed, which is now deflating. And the ironic thing for our industry is, you know, we got blamed for a lot of the last crash. Um, we are, you know, the most remote, uncorrelated part to this crash that's happening because tech may have lots of issues, but at least we tend as an industry not to use a lot of debt. And this is all about debt and credit. So on the one hand, all this stuff happening in the economic, in the economic climate right now doesn't have a lot to do with, with us. But on the other hand, the big lesson that I think a lot of us learned in 2000, 2001, 2002 is you know, the economy today, every part of the economy is integrated with every other part. Um, and so if, for example, housing prices fall, then consumers will probably spend less. If consumers spend less, then corporate earnings will fall. If corporate earnings fall, then companies will cut back on capital spending and start to do layoffs. If that happens, Tech companies will start to miss their earnings. You know, consumers will start to spend less, and then you get into a vicious spiral, and you get into a recession. And, and of course, one of the first things that companies cut in in, in lean times is, is their marketing. Is the market but It's the easiest thing to cut because you don't have to fire anybody. That's one of the themes of this uh, conference: is you know, what are the models of advertising that might work? Because advertising is, you know, not 100 percent of the oxygen in this economy, in the web economy, but it is, you know, the, an awful lot of it. Yeah. Um, and your company, uh, I, I would presume, has a strong yes. advertising model to it. Yes. Please, you intend for it to. Yes. So talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah. You, Ning is a social is a, is a, is a social network play, but yes. different. Yes. Um, perhaps, first of all, you can tell me you know, why Ning's not Facebook. Sure. So Ning is a platform for people to create their own social networks for any topic. So basically, it's a platform on top of which people create a very large number of Facebooks, if you will, or of MySpaces or of YouTubes. And so the vital statistics on Ning right now, there's about a quarter of a million distinct individual social networks that have been built, um, all by users. About 70% of those are active, uh, as in have been used in the last 30 days. Um, on average, they're, they're growing quite quickly. Page views on the system are growing at about 10% week over week. 
Uh, we're adding about a million registered users a month right now, and that number is growing pretty fast. Uh, we're adding about 1,500 members a day, and that number is also growing pretty fast. And so basically what's happening is people are discovering that social networking is something that they want to have essential to their lives, and not only do they want to be on a big centralized service like Facebook or MySpace, but they also want to apply it to their family or to their church or to their school or to their job. But they also would like to be able to take the data they've created there at Name and or at Facebook and or at MySpace or anywhere else with them into Ning, through Ning, out of Ning. So how do you feel about the idea of data portability? Um, so generally speaking, we're pro. Um, what we've done basically is along those lines is we built Ning to be a very general purpose programmable platform. And one of the things you can do on Ning is you can import and export data to your heart's content. And in fact, you can write any kind of import or export script at any time you want uh, to, to push Just data like everybody out, else. to pull data out, exactly. <laughs> um, so in, in general, it's, it's very freeform from that standpoint. I, I will say though, it, 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 there is not a lot of consumer demand yet for that, that kind of thing. Well, isn't that more a developer demand thing? Uh, in some cases, um, although that's a, a very large amount of this industry and that these markets developing uh, has to do with something very simple, which is new service. People like the ideas of new services, especially when they're free. They like adopting them. Um, we have this sort of global sort of class of early adopters in the world today um, of people who just love these new things when they pop up, whether it's Ning or you know the next or something else. Um, and so, generally speaking, there's actually. Right now in the market, not that much resistance to people just jumping on the new thing, <laughs> creating an account, uploading content. Now, Google, uh, some would say in response to Facebook, others would say no, they were planning it all along, has uh, uh, laid out a, a framework called Open Social. Um, you sort of ascribed to that framework publicly. Um, what's it going to take to make that matter to the people who use Ning? You know, what, what is it that Oh, I mean, I think it, it sort of matters. Well, so I think it sort of matter, matters by default. So, um, it, I mean, so Facebook did an amazing thing last year, uh, uh, and, and you know, rolling out and, and really proliferating the concept of the social networking platform as something where you know users can take applications that basically plug into their profiles. Um, that's an idea that makes a tremendous amount of sense. The fact that those applications can draw on the underlying social information is, is, is incredibly important. I think we're still at the very early days in understanding what the implications of, of that are for things like, for example, advertising. Um, and so that, that's a powerful idea. Um, as originally implemented, the Facebook platform was completely specific to Facebook. And so there was a natural need for somebody to create kind of an open version of that that lots of people could implement. And so, you know, MySpace signed up for Open Social, Yahoo now has, MySpace has, we have, I, you know, a whole bunch of people, including obviously Google. Now, as it turns out, the Facebook platform, you know, has, has, has in the meantime been highly successful, and Facebook itself is apparently getting more open about the platform, and there are some people who have licensed or are implementing it uh, in parallel, and I think, you know, directionally that's the trend, you know, that I would anticipate that going. So I would think a lot of people like us will probably end up implementing both open social and the Facebook platform. Um, we have, we definitely have time for a couple of questions, so the mics are up front. Let's see. Jen and John are coming out with handhelds. Oh, they're coming out with handhelds shortly. Oh, oh, good. We've got one over here. So if there's a question in that general area, we can we can certainly take it. There's a question over here, Brady. Thanks. Um, I'm over here on the side. I don't know. Oh, oh, right on. We got one. Here. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask, in terms of your vision for Ning, do you consider yourself to be uh, still a platform for building platforms, or do you see yourself at all getting into the application business as well? Or are you more on the platform side or both? Oh, so we, we definitely view ourselves as a platform. So we definitely view ourselves as a system where people can build social networks of any kind, shape, description, customize them, program them, modify them. Um, and we are completely consumed by that challenge. And so, for example, the last thing we're going to do is start going into different verticals or creating our own networks or promoting our own networks or rolling up the successful networks or anything like that. We're just going to be a straight, horizontal, you know, as, as open as possible and, and, and allow as much diversity as possible. But you're going to be in the advertising business. Yes. And when you're in the advertising business, having some control slash relationship slash, you know, uh, oversight of the content that you are providing to marketers is important. So how do you... It depends. Um, so we, I should say we have a twin business model. So we have a business model where by default the service is free. Uh, running, creating and running a network and proliferating it, no matter how many users it has, is free. Um, we reserve the right to run ads against against those networks. Um, you can buy the right to run ads from us, convert the thing into a bit of paid service, which is very cheap, um, and then our and then our ads fall off. Uh, of course, if we get really good at running ads against, how are those CPMs going? That's not, so far, so good. I mean, the good news is you're up to like 17 cents. Yeah, exactly. No, we're actually quite a bit higher than that. 
Um, one of the nice things about one of the nice things about being from an advertising standpoint is all of the networks tend to be topically or geographically focused, and so they, they all tend to have a natural home. And so we're, what are you using AdSense? Well, right now we're just using AdSense, and we're just starting to really get into this. But as as, as you well know, there's now you know there's there's I don't know how many ad networks there are. You could probably tell me that, but there's a very large number of ad networks. Um, there's more and more ad networks in more and more countries. There's more and more ad networks in more and more verticals. There's all kinds of ways uh, to slice and dice this. Right. And I, th I think our approach is going to lend itself well to being able to slice and dice. Lots and lots of partners. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, Dan Trelford from the BBC. Um, it's going to be quite a historic event in a couple of months. Uh, Bill Gates is standing down for Microsoft after 30 years. Um, what's it like competing against him? Can you take us back to the any days of the 90s, and how would you sum up his contribution to the industry? <laughs> you know, he, he just, he, uh, you know, the only thing really to say on that is he, he made an unbelievable contribution to the industry. I mean, it, it's actually hard to even think, it's hard to even conceive, I was thinking about this in the car right now, it's hard to even conceive what this industry would be like if Microsoft hadn't standardized the operating system, and if IBM hadn't developed the PC. You know, it, it's, it's hard to even imagine what would have happened. And those of you who are in the industry in the early 80s remember that there were probably 60 or 70 different kinds of PCs, all of which were incompatible. Um, and if that sort of, if, if that regime had extended forward, uh, you know, for the next 10 or 15 years, this industry would be a lot smaller than it is now. And I, I don't know whether the internet in its current form would have ever happened. So I think that was an incredibly important thing to have, have happened. One of the interesting things about the industry right now is, you know, that has that's something that distinctly has not happened in the mobile world, right? The yep. mobile world is still structured much more like the PC industry was before Microsoft entered. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the things holding the mobile industry back is that it, it hasn't turned into that kind of horizontally structured sort of open industry. And I don't know if it, you know, and I don't know if it will. And, and, and until it does, it's hard to see how there will be the kind of explosive opportunity uh, on mobile platforms the way that there has been. Certainly, it continues to be on, on the PC for the last, you know, 25 years. We have a question over here. <clears throat> what can we do about the security holes in the browser? It kind of looks like a Swiss cheese. I can't do a damn thing about it. Um, I can't do anything about it. What I will say, the browser, the browser is, you know, the browser is hopefully better than hopefully better than this. But you know, the browser, you know, browsers, operating systems, system software that gets widely used over a long period of time uh, does tend to become quite complicated. And when you have a complicated system, you tend to have security issues, and you tend to have people who have a strong economic incentive to attack those systems and, and penetrate them. So. Um, you just have to have a continuous cat and mouse game, um, and you have to, uh, you know, you have to hold the vendors accountable. Obviously, open source helps a lot with that because you have a lot more eyes on the system. So, it'll be, uh, I'm sure, it'll be a continuous story for years to come. Might have something to do with Bill Gates as well. Hey, uh, last was one, it? by the way, we gotta wrap up. You, you must have came out from University of Illinois. So, my question is, what role do you see for academia in a conference like this? And from the other end, is there an inherent transformation that people who come from academia have to go through to make a real-world contribution in terms of building something like Netscape? Sure. So in general, uh, you know, academic, basically, I think anything that happens, anything in the tech industry that tends to succeed has generally been brewing in the academic world for often 10 or 20 or 30 years. You know, these, these things develop in labs for a very long period of time. And so the best way to tell what's going to happen in 10 or 20 years is actually to be in a university research lab, which is something I was, I was lucky enough to do. Um, now, that said, the business skills required to then turn that into a company or something that are, um, you know, it's possible to do what I did and pick them up sort of a, a, on the battlefield. Uh, it's possible to go to business school and learn them. Um, in general, I think a lot of universities are getting better at teaching business, you know, sort of alongside science uh, or alongside technology. Um, I think the more of that, the better. Um, and I think, you know, Stanford in particular out here has been uh, a, a very inspiring example of that. Uh, and one hopefully a lot more universities will be following in the future. Well, please join me in thanking Mark for coming in. Talk to you later.